Where do the Los Angeles Rams go from here? We talk about that. The Cincinnati Bengals big week 13 win. If Kenny Pickett is the future of the Pittsburgh Steelers and more coming up next here on Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL. Your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On NFL Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Monday, so that means you have me, Kevin Ostracker, one of the many NFL experts here on our network. We're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, of course, and thank you so much for tuning in with us, making us your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms, including over on YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On NFL is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their price pips rejection, you can win up to 10 times the money on your energy. First time users can receive 100% in the deposit match up to $100 or promo code locked on as pricepicks.com. Promo code locked on. And we have a ton to dive into today after a week 13, an exciting week 13 of Sunday action. We'll first talk with Jake Lisko of Locked On Bengals about the Bengals' big week 13 win over the Kansas City Chiefs. Then we'll move into a conversation with Travis Rogers of Locked On Rams and talk about their loss of the Seattle Seahawks, where they go from here as they are a three and nine football team so far and more. Then in the final segment, we'll pivot to Pittsburgh, talk about Kenny Pickett and the Pittsburgh Steelers with Chris Carter of Locked On Steelers and if Pickett is the future of that franchise. So let's now dive into our first conversation with Jake Lisko of Locked On Bengals. Well, the Cincinnati Bengals, they did it again. Three straight wins against Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs winning here in week 13. Clutch game, 27-24, statement one for the Bengals. And here to talk about it with me is Jake Liskow of Locked On Bengals. And Jake, for this game, there's a lot to dive into and a lot to look at. But why did this Bengals team do what they did? What was the catalyst to this win for Cincinnati? I wish I could tell you specifically what it was. The game was very, very swingy, and I don't know what it is about the Bengals' defense. Even without Shadobe Abuzier back there playing cornerback, where instead is Cam Taylor Britt, who at times was hurt in this game. I think Jalen Davis got a few snaps as well, but he, he just doesn't have the, the answers it feels like sometimes in these clutch moments and you go back to last year, there, there were some key sacks at times or interceptions at times. Again, in this game, Mahomes threw a ball that should have been picked, got lucky that the Bengals defenders collided a little bit, couldn't come down with the interception, but then in the clutch, when the chiefs are in position to really bleed a lot of time, go take a, a, a lead with a touchdown, Joseph Osai, a, a backup player, rotational player, a sub package player for the Bengals gets in there and gets just enough of Mahomes trying to step up in the pocket for a sack to push the Chiefs into a very difficult field goal that they end up missing. A 55-yard field goal gets pushed wide right by Harrison Bucker. So it's it's guys stepping up in this game. It's Jermaine Pratt stripping the ball from Travis Kelsey, who went the first half without a catch, and then in the second half when he finally gets the ball, he fumbles in one of his first opportunities, if not his first opportunity. And, and then it's, you know, Samaj P. Ryan dragging guys and, and getting gritty yards, converting third downs that are a result of him breaking tackles and getting yards after contact. It's Joe Burrow playing at a very, very high level, and he doesn't do it in the flashy ways that Mahomes and Justin Herbert do with the laser beams throwing 50 yards down the field. But what we've talked about with Joe Burrow lately is just his ability to continue to play on time and accurate not putting the ball in danger, even though he has some interceptions lately. Those are coming off of tip passes at the line of scrimmage for the most part. He had a touchdown pass dropped in this one, which is one of the most shocking things that I've seen in a football game in a long time. Tyler Boyd, one of the most reliable, least drop prone receivers in the NFL, had a walk-in touchdown that kind of bounced off his helmet as it was dropping into his bread basket. So it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. I think the Bengals are a really good football team. I thought this was going to be, or at least had the potential to be, a real back-and-forth game with the Chiefs. And while the Chiefs made all the plays in the middle of the game, really converting a lot of third downs against blitzes, getting some explosive plays off of those, the Bengals going 0-3 for in the middle of the game on three straight red zone possessions, the Bengals made those plays on the stretch. And they were huge, huge plays for this team. And 
than just not giving the ball back to Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. Again, Samaj P. Ryan, offensive line, Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow, you credit the entire offense in that part of the game for being clutch when they needed to run out the clock. Right, and Mahomes in this one held by that Cincinnati defense is just 223 yards passing. But, Jake, the big storyline in this one was the return of Jamar Chase to the field. How big was his impact in this one? I think it could have been bigger than it was, but it was certainly felt. He came up with some very important first downs. I think at times running his way back into the Chiefs' nightmares is at least what I tweeted. He led the Bengals receivers with seven seven catches for 97 yards, had a long of 40. and that explosive element, the way that coverages rotate and devote extra resources to, to Jamar Chase was noticeable early in the game and created opportunities for others. So Majay Piran, again, I think one of the beneficiaries, the Chiefs coming into this game with a similar approach to the Bengals on defense in terms of we don't want to get beat by the explosives. We don't want to let Jamar Chase be the reason that we lose after we gave up over 200 yards to him in one game last year at one point. And he still gets his yards, but... A lot of underneath stuff opened up by the presence of Jamar Chase. T. Higgins, for example, benefiting from this. Uh, A touchdown probably benefiting from this when the Chiefs lose Chris Evans coming across the field. So he's getting his production, and you're seeing things open up for the rest of the offense as well. Joe Burrow going 25 of 31 in this game, very, very efficient. And, And like I said, one of those incomplete passes should have been a touchdown pass, should have been a 25 or so yard touchdown pass that Tyler Boyd drops. So I think that individually he's making his impact and you're also seeing an impact in the way that he's causing defenses to devote extra resources to trying to contain him and opening things up for the rest of the offense. I know another storyline that a lot of people are talking about is the AFC North right now and just what Mm -hmm. it looks like. The Ravens and the Bengals atop the North, both at 8-4. and Every team won in the division on Sunday in Week 13. Cleveland and Pittsburgh both at 5-7. and So it does seem like this is a two-team race between Baltimore and between Cincinnati. Now, Baltimore does have the tiebreaker right now based off of that Week 5 primetime win, but they do match up again last week of the season. Where are you on Cincinnati's chances to steal that division from Baltimore winning? It's still hard, right? Even with the the injury potentially to Lamar Jackson causing him to miss some games, that schedule for the Ravens is just, oh, so incredibly soft. And the schedule for the Bengals, conversely, maybe it's no longer the hardest in the NFL because the Chiefs are now in the rearview mirror. But if it's not the hardest in the NFL, it's certainly near the top with games against Tampa, against, uh, against Buffalo, against the Ravens themselves in week 18 against the Browns next week in Cincinnati, a team that has had their number. It's still hard. It's still an uphill battle. But right now, the Bengals are just playing in such a way that they've got to believe they can beat anyone. They've won now six out of their last seven games, with their only loss being that Halloween primetime loss to the Browns where they really got trampled and just couldn't get anything going. Something about the Browns team just has their number. But it's harder for the Bengals, I would say, but I think it's impossible to write them off the way they're playing right now with quality wins, blowing out some lesser, lesser quality opponents uh, in the NFC coming out of the NFC South, the Steelers, even though that ends up being a seven point game that wasn't really in doubt in the fourth quarter and then getting good, gritty, controlled wins against the Titans and, and then the Chiefs. Y- you like their chances really in every game going forward. Some of them will be very difficult, but it's hard to say that it's out of the realm of possibility, even though all of those tiebreakers seem to tilt Baltimore's way. Right. It seems like it will come down to the wire. That week 18 matchup could be for the division in terms of tiebreakers and whatnot. But the Bengals, a statement win against the Chiefs on Sunday. For more on the Bengals, be sure to check out Jake over at the Locked On Bengals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Jake, thanks so much. It's going to be a tight race in the AFC North, I think, between Baltimore and Cincinnati coming down to the wire. So I'm excited to see how that all shakes out. But coming up in our second segment, we'll be diving into where the Los Angeles Rams go from here with Travis Rogers of Locked On Rams. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to dive into here on Locked On NFL. But first... 
This episode is sponsored by Total Wine and More. This holiday, find what you love with Total Wine and More with so many great bottles to choose from. It's easy to find a new favorite single barrel bourbon or the perfect gifts for everyone on your list with some help from a friendly guide. And all with the confidence of knowing you found something special for the lowest price. You'll love what you find only at Total Wine and More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly, B21. And this episode is sponsored by Simply Safe at Lockdown NFL. We believe home should be where you and your family feel safe, especially over the holidays. This season, give yourself and your family the gift of peace and protection with the number one rated home security system, Simply Safe. And right now, Simply Safe is offering Lockdown NFL listeners 40% off new security system, but don't put this off. And here's why so many people love it they have many advanced technology features like controlling your system from your smartphone app, viewing your crystal clarity security camera feeds, and also a wide range of high tech sensors. And in an emergency, 24 7 professional monitoring agents use fast protect technology. It's solution is simply safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat or so you can get higher priority police response. And with the top rated simply safe app, you can stay in complete control of your system, arm and disarm, unlock for a guest, access your cameras, or adjust system settings anytime, anywhere. Don't miss your chance to save big on so many people's favorite security systems. Get 40% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash locked on NFL today. At simplysafe.com slash locked on NFL, there's no safe like Simply Safe. We're back here, our second segment of Locked on NFL here on Monday. Kevin Allstriker, your host, still here with you. Thank you so much again for tuning in with us, making us your first listen of the day. And we're now going to dive into a conversation with Travis Rogers of Locked on Rams. The Rams losing their sixth straight game, this time to the Seattle Seahawks in week 13. And we talk with Travis about where the Rams go from here and more. So let's dive into that now. Well, the Los Angeles Rams have not had the season that many were expecting them to. Here to talk about that with me, Travis Rogers, the host over at Locked On Rams. And Travis, another loss for the Rams here in week 13, 27-23 to the Seahawks. And this was without Matthew Stafford. Obviously, you know, Cooper Cup, Allen Robinson, Aaron Donald, not in this one either. This Rams team, a lot of talent on the roster, but they just have not put it together this season. A lot of factors going into that. What was the factor in this game, though? Why did they drop this one? Well, I think this one was just a matter of that they ran out of gas. I, I you know, as disappointing as it is to say this out loud at, at three and nine, I think they played their best game of the season today. I really do. I, I think that this was the first time all season long where the offense had some sustained ability to move the ball on the ground. They ran for over 170 yards collectively, which is a season high for them. I thought John Wolford was good enough to win the game. He obviously had a couple interceptions along the way, but you know, Geno Smith made a great drive at the end of the game. There's no Aaron Donald. There's no Ashawn Robinson. There's no Troy Hill. Those are three starters on the defensive side of the ball that did not play today. And, you know, I'll, I'll give the credit to the Seahawks because it, where the Rams are this season, it's been terribly disappointing. But I actually thought they played pretty well today. Where, where they are in this season, I think this was their best performance. And I know a lot of people are now looking towards the future for the Rams, but they obviously made a lot of trades in the last couple of seasons here to acquire Top end talent. You look back to the Matthew Stafford trade, Jalen Ramsey a couple of years ago, Von Miller at the trade deadline last year. So they don't necessarily have a ton of top end picks to work with. Where do they go from here? I know the Matthew Stafford with his injury on IR doesn't seem necessarily likely he's going to return this year because he'd have mm-hmm. to be back for the final week of the season. So do you maybe take a swing on a, on a mid round quarterback and see what you have there next season? Do you kind of wait it out? Where do you go in this kind of what could be a rebuild? Yeah, I don't think that um, quarterback is really a big need of theirs at this point. I think Matthew Stafford will come back next year and be more like the player we saw a year ago. Um, I think what they need to do is to start to restock the pantry, for lack of a better phrase. You don't need to go buy any more entrees. You need to go buy the things that you make the meal with. You need to go find some depth on your offensive line. You need to find some depth uh, on your defensive line with guys that are not named Aaron Donald. You need to find a running back that can give you a – consistent performance from one week to the next you know maybe it'll be Kyron Williams Cam Akers was a lot better today I thought it was one of his better performances as well but in particular on that offensive line because you know where they are this season they've played 13 different offensive linemen this year they've had every guy on their own line with the exception of Rob Havenstein has missed at least four games or more they're down to your fifth string left tackle so you know I don't care how deep you are if you have injuries like this it's going to catch up with you but 
I don't think that they need to go, um, you know, home run swinging. I think that they need to get guys that can start for them or guys that can be frontline backups for them. Something that they were able to do the previous couple of years, you know, um, two years ago, Tutu Atwell was their top pick. That one really hasn't panned out this year. Logan Bruss was their top draft pick. He got hurt in training camp. He hasn't been there all season long. So finding some guys that will not only make your team and maybe contribute here and there, but guys that may be able to start and guys that may be able to be frontline backups, I think is the key in particular on the offensive line. And based off the play that you've seen this year from all the positional groups, would you classify offensive line as their biggest need moving forward? By a mile. But by by a mile times a mile times a mile, it has been um, it, it from day one. This has been a problem. The, the, this was going to be the question coming out of of last season. Andrew Whitworth retires. Austin Corbett goes to Carolina. So you're losing two fifths of a Super Bowl winning offensive lineman and not just two guys. But Andrew Whitworth was the heart and soul of this offense. He was the guy that set the tone for everybody. So there's going to be. Um, some changeover to be sure, and then add changeover to a whole bunch of injury, and they just never got going. So if they can get that fixed, uh, I, I think that they'll get back to where they are very quickly. This has been a, a really disappointing season, but I think that they're, if we're looking for silver linings, this is something that Sean McVay can learn from, how valuable the, the some of these picks may be and how you need to make sure that you have some depth and some spots that maybe you've been very thin at for the last couple of years and gotten away with it. Right, and so for the for the rest of this season, what what are your goals? What do you want the Rams to achieve over these next couple of games here throughout this rest of the season? This is going to sound silly, Kevin, but I think the fact I win a game, win a game. You know, they're 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 on a six game losing streak right now. They went into their bye at three and three, and very much in it in the NFC West in the NFC playoff picture. They came out of their bye. They've lost six in a row. They have the Raiders here in four days. They play on Thursday night this week. Um, the Raiders are playing a lot better than they were a few weeks ago. So all of a sudden, that Raider game gets very challenging. You have a Monday night in Green Bay. You've got the Chargers on Sunday night football. And then you've got to go to Seattle. All of those games are games that the Rams will be underdogs in. The one game that I think you look at and think, okay, the Rams have a pretty good chance to win that one is Christmas Day against the Denver Broncos. And you know, ending the season on an 11-game losing streak, ending the season with just three wins would be, um, not, I mean, disappointment doesn't even begin to cover it. I, I think from here on out, with the five games remaining, is find a way to win a game or two. Yeah, it'd be disaster. 11-game losing streak, an absolute disaster. But when you look at what the NFC West has done this year outside of the Rams, Travis, what, what's your outlook on it? Has it changed ever since the beginning of the year? Well, it, yeah. I mean, at the beginning of the year, it felt like it was going to be the, the Rams were the favorites to win the division, followed closely by the 49ers. And then, you know, maybe if there was going to be a third playoff team out of the division, Arizona, well, you know, here you are in week 13. Arizona's terrible. The Rams are terrible. So those two teams are kind of dead in the water. And San Francisco was probably the hottest team in the league over the last couple of weeks until what happened to Garoppolo earlier today. So who knows what happens there? The Seahawks went from out of the playoff picture to into the playoff picture today, and they're probably the healthiest, best team right now, at least on the offensive side of the ball. San Francisco's got that incredible defense. They still got a ton of playmakers, but Mr. Irrelevant is their quarterback going into the last part of the season, which is extraordinary to think about because they've lost their front two guys. And Feels like it's Seattle's division to win at this point, as weird as that is to say. Yeah, I know there was the quarterback controversy in the training camp portion, the preseason between who was going to start between Geno Smith and Drew Locke in Seattle. But yeah, now you have Geno Smith doing his thing. But the Rams will be looking for a win. Thursday night is their next opportunity. If you want to go check out more on the Los Angeles Rams, be sure to check out Travis's work at the Locked On Rams podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Travis, thanks so much. Hopefully an 11-game losing streak is not in the cards for the Los Angeles Rams. We'll have an opportunity again to get a win on Thursday night football coming up here in just a few days. Coming up in our final segment, we'll go to Pittsburgh, talk with Chris Carter of Locked On Steelers about Kenny Pickett, that Pittsburgh team, and more. So be sure to stay tuned. We still have a ton to dive into here on the show. But first, this episode is sponsored by Prize Picks. And I, again, very good week in fantasy. Very pleased with it. Very big fantasy guy over here. But if you want a different twist, be sure to check out Prize Picks. Prize Picks makes it super easy to use. It's very easy to play, and you can have a ton of current entries. And how it works, pick two to five players. And if they will go score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can up to 10 times money on your entry. There's no competing against other people. So super projections available. Prize Picks offers projections on eSports. Do you watch the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, you have NHL, PJ, college football, college basketball, 
and more educated bait in 60 seconds or less is that easy. They have safe and fast withdrawals and they're currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. Download the Price Picks app or go to PricePicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users are going to receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code LOCKDOWN. That means you deposit $100. Price picks will give you $100, you deposit $50. Price picks will give you $50. Don't forget the promo code locked on to sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100. We're back here rounding out locked on NFL. Kevin Allstriker still here after week 13 Sunday action. Thank you so much again for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day. Now be sure to make your second listen locked on sports today. The biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. And now to round out the show, we'll talk with Chris Carter of Locked On Steelers. Pittsburgh winning two straight games, this time against the Atlanta Falcons. We'll talk about Kenny Pickett's future and more now. Well, the Pittsburgh Steelers pick up a 19-16 to win over the Atlanta Falcons in Week 13. I know there have been plenty of storylines in Pittsburgh about the future, who is the future, especially at the quarterback position here to dive into that with me today. It's Chris Carter, the host of Locked On Steelers. And Chris, the Steelers, two straight wins under their belt. They are a 5-7 football team. Let's start off with this game, 1916 against the Atlanta Falcons, a road win for the Steelers. Who, who impressed you in this one? I mean, a few people impressed me. I, I thought Pat Frymuth had another really good game for the Steelers. He continues to be, I think, one of the better receiving tight ends in the NFL. Connor Hayward, the uh, the sixth-round draft pick, uh, Cam Hayward's little brother, he caught his first touchdown in the NFL in the same game. Cam Hayward got a sack in the town where uh, their father, Ironhead Hayward, used to play in Atlanta. That was pretty cool. Uh, but you know, I was impressed by a lot of different people in this game. Najee Harris, I'll say one thing. This offensive line for the Steelers has really come up this year. They were terrible run blockers to start the season, and they've developed into a really strong run, run blocking unit. They've had now five straight games rushing for over 100 yards. They used to be – what they used to like – happened five times a year over the past few years since they lost Le'Veon Bell. So uh, all in all, the team's coming up. But what's happening and what happened in this game was I think the Steelers kind of confirmed that their identity could be achieved this year offensively. The I, the whole idea this year on offense was to run the ball with Najee Harris and then supplement it with backup running backs and then occasionally hit on some big plays to Pat Fryermuth. George Pickens, Deontay Johnson, those type of guys. And it really hadn't come to fruition early. The run game wasn't taking off. And you saw that early on with the struggles uh, in, in, the first, in, the, in the first in the first ooh, six games of the year, seven games of the year. They had two games where they rushed it for over 100 yards. And you saw the impact that that had on the offense. It never let Mitch Trubisky. And eventually, Kenny Pickett kind of played in from a balanced sense. But since that they, they started rushing better, one of those was against the Eagles. That was a blowout. That was a blowout loss. That that doesn't count as much. But the Saints game carried them to a win. The Bengals game almost carried them to a win, and then the Colts game carries them to another win. And then now the uh, the the win the win today over the Falcons carried them to yet another win. And it's just it's not asking Kenny Pickett to do too much. You look at his stats. Tw- uh, um, actually, excuse me. Actually, I had the wrong game up. Look at look at me. But. <laughs> Another game where he threw 28 passes. He wasn't asked to do too much in this game. He wasn't said it, it wasn't like, hey, can he pick it? Come out here and throw for you know 400 yards. They they just said, just come out, be consistent, manage the game, be efficient, and that's what he was able to do. And it was 16 of 28 for 197 yards, a touchdown, no interceptions. Also, no interceptions for four straight games. A really good tick up considering he threw a bunch in his first several games. Right, and I know there's been a lot of conversation throughout these last couple of weeks, couple of months, about Kenny Pickett and his future as the start of the Pittsburgh Steelers moving forward. And obviously, he, look, he's a rookie. He's working through things. He's learning right now. It is very, very early. But some people I've seen are ready to move off of Kenny Pickett. Other people are all in on Kenny Pickett. Where are you on the Kenny Pickett train so far through his rookie year? I'm on the keep waiting and seeing. I'm waiting until his third year, like mid third year before I start to decide, okay, is it time to move on from, I covered this guy in college. Kenny Pickett's a, a very much a fighter. You know, he's not going to have the biggest arm. He's not going to have the fastest legs, but he works through his progressions. He works to understand his offense, to build chemistry with his office. And he studies the game. In fact, just last week against the Colts, he called the game winning touchdown play. They, he, when they were in the red zone, he said, he said, look, I saw that, that the Colts were very good against the pass in the red zone. I saw that, that that the most running success against them came when teams spread out. So I just called for a spread out formation, uh, and we kind of ran an option play with Benny Snell. And I knew that there were two, there'd be two off ball guys, and I was hoping that one of them would stick with me, and then Benny would just have to beat one of them. But turned out both of them stuck with me, and Benny walked into the end zone. Like 
the the ability to think through all of that as a rookie is and especially on a struggling offense what is impressive and i think that those are the things that you see him continuing to build he's he's going through his progressions more he's not just a one read quarterback uh for entire games those are the things that he's showing. And if he's able to do that, I think he becomes the franchise quarterback of the Steelers. That's what he did at Pitt. Uh, you know, he didn't light it up all his years at Pitt. Uh, he got really consistent, I want to say, his junior year and then his his first senior year because of COVID. He got two senior years. But his first senior year, he was really good. But his but Pitt had the most drops in the country as a wide receiver union. The second year the second year of his, of his senior years, he had Jordan Addison, a Bolitnikoff award winner, and they went off and he, had, he broke Deshaun Watson's ACC record. So I think that he's going to come along over time, but we're going to need to wait until maybe his third year in the NFL before we start stamping him with an identity. But I, I think in these moments, you're seeing him stay focused, avoid the big mistake, and give his team chances to win. That's all you can ask of your rookie right now. Right. And I know going into this year for some Steelers fans, it was, you know, the realistic reality that, you know, Ben Roethlisberger retires. They had some other retirements as well, so mm -hmm. it's just fun to it. I think Kenny Pickett, after stepping in for Trubisky, you know, he's doing what he can to pick up this offense, learn at the NFL level. This is a five and seven football team, Chris. Where are you with the remainder of this season for them? Right now, the AFC North is Baltimore and Cincinnati. Is this more learning lessons for next year? Or do you still think they have a chance to maybe sneak into a wild card spot if they go on a run? Well, I mean, I think the big thing with the wild card chase right now, when you look at the standings, uh, the Steelers, they have, there's so many teams ahead of them that are in the wild card hunt that have already beaten the Steelers. You look at the Dolphins, you look at the Jets, you look at the Patriots, uh, even the Browns, they get to play the Browns against so that, that could get neutralized. Uh, but, you know, those are a lot of teams that they're chasing right now. And you look at, you know, how how the how everything's made out. If the Steelers go on a crazy run, which would not be unprecedented, the Steelers have gone on some really good runs at the on the back end of seasons, even when they've had struggling quarterback play. Uh, but they would need to win what they have five games, six games left. So they would need to win five of those six games to finish with a winning record and to be nine and eight and then be in that conversation. But I, I do see some teams like the Jets, the Patriots, the Chargers, uh, and the Raiders kind of falling back in the rankings. And then it could just come down to them uh and then probably the two other teams in the AFC North, uh whoever doesn't you know make the uh you know win the division. Uh you know the Ravens and the and the Bengals are tied right now. Um, so kind of, I guess with, with those two teams probably stay up, stay ahead of them. Uh, but if they're able to beat the Browns in the, in the season finale, and maybe they get to the end with a nine and eight record, maybe they are in that conversation. Maybe they are in the, you know, able to fight for, for that. But, you know, I think the one, and one thing I've said for a while, the back end of their schedule was going to be a lot easier than the front end. You know, they just beat the Colts. They just beat the Falcons. You know, they play the Ravens twice still, but with Lamar Jackson hurt. Who knows how that can go? Uh, they play the Browns. We saw you know, at the end of the season, we saw them kind of struggle with the Texans a bit, need a lot of defensive and special teams touchdowns, but they still got the Panthers and they still got the Raiders on their schedule. Two teams that I, I think with the way, if the, if the Steelers bring their, the best version of what they have going on right now, they can, can they can beat and they can contend and definitely beat those two teams. So I, I think, they handle the business with the with the out of out of division teams, and then if they can just kind of find a way to only lose one of their three remaining division games, maybe they're in that conversation. But still, make no mistake, this year is about moving forward. I, I think Steelers fans would happily trade a lot of Kenny Pickett development, setting him up for the future, over sneaking in as the seventh seed of the playoffs and having to play the Buffalo Bills again. Right. And it, it makes sense. And even, with those divisional matchups, they flip so easily with, they with do. every team, regardless of if a team is 15 and 0, or if a team is 0 and 15, those divisional matchups always have those extra oomphs to them. You mentioned Pittsburgh playing Baltimore this upcoming weekend in week 14, going for their third straight victory here in the 2022 season. But Chris, thanks so much for hopping on here. If you want to check out more of Chris's work on the Steelers, be sure to check out the Locked On Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Chris, thanks so much. I think Pittsburgh is building something for the future here. I think you have to give Kenny Pickett some time to develop and continue. You know, he's only a rookie right now, so there's still a lot of room to grow for him over the next couple of seasons. That's all I have for you here today, though, on Lockdown NFL. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me get back here tomorrow. It'll be more content with your Tuesday host, so be sure to stay tuned for that, and we will see you right back here tomorrow.